Hey folks, thanks for joining us today. We're going to talk a little bit about document review, and I know that we've titled this week's skill session document review, but that might also include other ways that people might ask to get your feedback on programs or work that they're doing. So um, first of all, it might be helpful just to say, what do we mean by um, document review? What kinds of documents might they be asking people who have lived experience to review? Um, they may be asking you to review or offer feedback on curriculum and training slides. So if they're having lesson plans to teach about trafficking, to maybe look over in Human Trafficking 101, or maybe um, a presentation or curriculum about um, serving um, LGBTQ survivors, or it might be something about providing housing or legal services to survivors. They may ask you to review things that they call technical assistance products and manuals. And technical assistance is a word that we use in the nonprofit field. Um, it's sort of like a, a mix between life coaching and customer service, but that's basically where someone, instead of just providing services to survivors, it's someone who provides services to other people and organizations who provide services to survivors. So it's sort of like giving feedback and working through ideas for organizations and people who are doing anti-trafficking work on how to do it more effectively and in line with the evidence. Organizations may also ask people with lived experience to give them feedback or um, to review documents that outline their agency's protocols. So things like shelter policies, um, safety procedures, um, prevention strategies, trauma-informed protocols, just to see if those really resonate with people who have lived experience. Because a lot of times you look at agency protocols and they may look good on the surface to someone who's not themselves a survivor or doesn't know a lot of survivors as like friends or colleagues. Um, and then you have someone who's working in the field who has lived experience, and they may be able to look at that and say, I think this piece right here is going to create an unnecessary barrier to someone getting their services. They may have you um, give feedback on program plans and project management charts. So a lot of times when people are developing a program, whether it's a, a new nonprofit or a shelter program, or an outreach program, or a youth education program, they may develop um, written documents, or charts, or um, sample timelines and calendars. They may be writing out plans that identify different staff that may do different parts of the role, basically just sort of getting a little bit of a visual map of what they think that program will look like. Um, the same thing with the project. Maybe there's, it's not the whole program that we're developing, but maybe there's a project you're going to do, such as um, a project where you develop and complete a document um, that's going to be um, distributed widely. So you might develop a chart or planning documents to help you plan a timeline and the necessary steps that you'll need to complete that project. So they may have you look at these charts and be like, what do you think? And on those, you can give feedback like, I, I think you might be a little ambitious about the timeline. Uh, that's a, a very common feedback you'll find people giving. That's feedback I wish sometimes people would give me when I'm getting excited about a new project. But does the timeline look realistic? Does it look like they've assigned enough staff? Does it look like they have a plan for getting people to implement this plan who have the needed skills to do it well? Um, have they built some, some solid mentoring into their program plan? Meaning if they're hiring survivors to do work and they expect the survivors to just come out of the gate and be able to start with the work, um, they, they may want to build in professional development. Even if it's not survivors, are you paying for them to get the training? Are you giving them plenty of time to get onboarded? These are things you can look at as you learn more about how these projects and programs run. You can start giving them more feedback about whether or not what they're proposing is realistic or likely to work. They may have you review evaluation plans. Um, an evaluation plan is where you write up um, a document that outlines how you want to determine if you're achieving your goals. 
So an example of that might be surveys that you provide your existing clients to see if you're meeting their needs um, and what you can do to improve. If you're doing a prevention programming, you know, we can't really measure whether or not we've increased or decreased trafficking in our, in our prevention work. But what we can do is measure whether or not we're increasing protective factors and decreasing risk factors. And we know that if we can decrease risk factors and increase protective factors that we're gonna be preventing trafficking, right? So um, that you can evaluate that with a survey or with other forms of um, evaluation instruments is what they call them. So they may have you take a look. Does this look like we're um, being thorough in our evaluation plan? If our evaluation plan involves talking to or surveying survivors, are we ensuring that we're doing this in a trauma-informed way and that's ethical and that's been looked at by a review board? These are feedback you can give them. Um, they may ask you to, to give feedback or review stories or news articles or content for one of their web pages um, to give you um, to give them feedback about whether or not they captured the information they had received in a realistic way. Um, give them feedback about whether or not it's too sensationalized. Like, is it necessary in a news article where you're telling a survivor's story to be like, and, and they slept night after night on the cold, hard floor in the damp darkness? Or can you just say, you know, they weren't provided with appropriate um, shelter and place to stay while doing the labor? Right, like, do we need to be as sensationalized um, as they often want to be? They may also have you um, review articles, book chapters, or an, even an entire book, right? They may ask if you're interested in reviewing these. Um, one thing that is important to remember that's a hot topic um, right now, a big conversation, a big shift we're seeing, is there's been a lot of research showing that even when organizations do survivor engagement and get survivor um, participation in their programs, they tend to only do so when they're implementing a program that they've already developed. So they tend to not say, dear, dear person with lived experience, we want you to collaborate with us on developing a curriculum. They may just develop a curriculum based on what they think will work and then reach out to survivors with a mostly completed curriculum and say, you want to give us some review? Or they may develop a curriculum without a whole lot of survivor engagement and then hire survivors to go be part of the training or delivery. And when that happens, we end up missing out on those amazing lived experience insights at the um, planning and the design and the development stages. We miss out on having it from the beginning. And that can leave survivors feeling like they're expected to rubber stamp someone's project. Like, right, you didn't really want survivor input. You just wanted me to look at it and say a few nice things about it so you could then say, it's survivor engaged. This product is survivor informed. Um, when someone comes to you with a project that didn't have survivor engagement all along, a lot of times you look at it and as a person, you're like, man, they have put hours into this. I do not want to tell them that the best feedback I can give them right now is to scrap this all and start over. But every survivor leader I know has been asked to review something where that was what they actually thought, whether they said that or not. This project is a horrible idea. Whoever told you it's just a good idea to do this, but you don't want to say that. So you find yourselves making a few little recommendations to make it slightly less horrible. And when that happens, those, those organizations have missed out on the opportunity to create something really meaningful and impactful, right? Um, I will say sometimes um, they don't, they, uh, there may be survivor engagement in the development. So sometimes I, I do this myself, like this is an example. I may hire because I don't have infinite funds. I wish the NSN had infinite money because I would hire so many people to do so many things, but I don't. So what I may do is hire maybe two consultants to partner with me in the planning, design, and development of a product. And then because I know that while those two consultants are survivors, 
those two consultants don't know everything about everything that any survivor has ever experienced. They know what they know, right? But I want to have a lot of people take a look and give me new perspectives, fresh perspectives. So after I've contracted with those two survivors to help me develop the thing, I may still have a few more survivors that I pay to give it feedback and review so that I can make sure we're really getting broad perspectives. So sometimes people will reach out to you and ask you if you'll review something. And you can make choices in your contracting work. You can be like, I don't participate in review of things that didn't have survivor engagement in its planning and design. That is a boundary I myself have set when people have asked me about um, reviewing or having um, NSN members review things. And I've said, were there survivors engaged in the development and planning? And if the answer is no, I don't pass it along because I don't want anyone to ever feel like they have to rubber stamp something. I don't want to feel like that. Um, but sometimes they, maybe they did have survivors involved. <clears throat> so you can always ask if you aren't sure. Were there survivors on the team who planned and created this? Um, and then based on their answer, you can choose how you respond. So maybe if they write back and say yes, then you're like, cool, let's go. I can do this. <clears throat> if they say no, you may choose not to do that, or you may choose to reply back to them and say, thank you for sharing that. I wanted to let you know that I'm going to give you really honest and transparent um feedback, right? So um, a lot of times when there weren't survivors in the um, development and planning stages, the products need a whole lot more revision. And so I just wanted you to know in advance that it may take me a little longer um, to give this review and that the feedback you get may involve a lot more suggested changes. That then gives you permission to not feel like you have to rubber stamp it it also educates them. Oh, we should be getting survivors in at the beginning of planning projects. Got it, got it, got it, right? That, that kind of like helps educate them. It also, if they're genuinely only interested in a rubber stamp, may give them an opportunity to say, actually, I think we were only planning for like um, paying you for 30 minutes of review. We weren't expecting it to be that big. And, you know, at least then you know before you get into something what you're getting into. So there's some different reasons people may ask for review and feedback, um, and they may be looking for different things. So document review is a great way to make sure that people who have lived experience, who also have a variety of backgrounds, can point out gaps, ideas, misconceptions, challenges, or even unintentional tokenizing or stereotyping in your work. <laughs> Excuse me. Sometimes well-meaning um, allies can, and even well-meaning survivors working in the field can create documents that contain stereotypes either about survivors, about traffickers, there can be racial stereotypes, stereotypes about migrants or people who English isn't their first language. Sometimes you can catch these things and be like, I, I think this here we might want to reword or reconsider. It's a great way to bring in more perspectives when you don't have funding for a whole lot of team members with um, lived experience. And that's something that I, I mentioned in the example I gave earlier, I often do that. And it also ensures you can get perspectives from survivors who may not have the capacity or specialized skills to develop the project. And what that means is there may be a survivor who's like really awesome. They're an amazing consultant and you know that they would have great contributions and you reach out to see if they are interested in collaborating and they say, actually, I can't. Like I'm just slammed right now and um, I can't take any new clients until um, February right now. I won't have the capacity to review it. And you need to get that, do that document out before February. Um, so they can't collaborate. Well, then you can write back and say, well, if you're not on the collaborator team, would you at least be willing, uh, would you have capacity to give us a couple of hours of just final review once we have the draft ready, right? So that's one way you can get um, some feedback. It may also be that someone doesn't have the professional knowledge that you need to develop it. And I'm going to say something. Sometimes we get pushback because survivors are like, so used to being talked over by people who don't have lived experience and saying, well, you know, what, what we know is um, 
But the reality is surviving trauma is a specific set of skills, but it doesn't mean you suddenly have every set of skills that you need for any anti-trafficking job, right? There's other skills we can continue to develop. No one can teach you about your lived experience. Someone can teach you skills that you might need to do things like run a shelter, plan a program, manage a budget. They can also teach you some of the um, skills that you need to know about other people's lived experience, right? They may not be able to teach you about your lived experience. You're the expert in your lived experience, but also being an expert in your lived experience does not make you an expert in all of human trafficking, right? So let's say that you have some really brilliant um, lived experience, um, folks with lived experience who um, have a broad variety of lived experiences, but they may not have the skills or capacity um, to develop a medical protocol, for example, or a full draft of shelter um, processes and protocols, because there's a lot of legal things for shelters that, re that receive federal funds that they're required to do in certain ways. And so um, that might be a chance to bring in people who maybe didn't have the skills you were looking for um, to do all of the project as a collaborator. Um, but you can still bring them in to give you some of those lived experience insights. I will say if you find yourself in that situation often, then maybe it's time for you to write a grant proposal to try to get some funding to provide that bridge of um, professional development for those survivors who want to do this work to learn some of the skills that they need to um, collaborate with you more fully. Um, if you if you have to do that because you don't have survivors with the skills that you need, uh, that does not mean that you can just hire someone to give you feedback and check the box and say you're done. That means you need to be rethinking how you're going to foster that meaningful survivor leadership. So um, this is this picture made me laugh. Um, if you have specialized skills and professional experience, use it. Right. So you don't have to take off your survivor hat to put on your shelter manager hat. You don't have to take off your social worker hat to put on your survivor hat. We all wear many hats. Um, some of us can be social workers, peer advocates, peer mentors, hospital advocates, trainers, teachers, um, program managers, like there, these are all multiple skills and some people have multiple of them. So just because someone hires you to give survivor review doesn't mean that you should limit yourself to only giving your lived experience feedback. If you know some of the things about the professional skill or um, product that they're having you review, share it, tell them. Um, Sometimes they may not be familiar with your other work, right? Like that happens to me a lot. People will be like, I hear you're really good at survivor or whatever, um, and may have no idea what my other work experience and skills are. So I'm going to go ahead and provide it. Um, offering technical guidance in addition to your lived experience insight, that's one way we can push back against them accidentally tokenizing us. I want to come on that project with some of my other skills I've learned. And when they say, oh, well, what do you think? What's the survivor perspective? I can start talking to them about the specialized skills that I've been developing and how that might help. Like, oh, here's a thing that I actually know about violence prevention. Or, oh, I think your project management timeline might be a little too rushed and we should think about some capacity. That causes the people you're in the meeting with to have this aha moment where they're like, oh, yeah. Survivors are whole people who often know so many things that we have not tapped into when we accidentally tokenize them. The other thing is that can be good professional networking when you share those other knowledge and skills in a meeting. And again, relevant to the meeting, you don't want to have them ask you a question about a shelter guideline and proceed to talk for 10 minutes about all your qualifications and trainings and resume. You just want to drop that knowledge that you have in the conversation in a way that, that gets their attention, because that way, the next time that they need to have collaborators on that project, they will remember, oh, yeah, this person has lived experience and some specialized skills and professional experience, and you will be more likely to get those opportunities 
to participate in the planning, design, and, and development of programming. Even if we're just talking about our lived experience insights and not our professional or technical skills, um, I, I chose this picture because I feel like what people think lived experience insights are is the part of the iceberg that's above the water. But really, there's so many other lived experience insights that we bring to, a, um, to our work. And so we may be able to share things like noticing when a proposed policy will exclude some survivors. I can give you an example with the um, Trafficking Survivors Relief Act. Um, which is still not passed, but we've been negotiating. It is an act, a bill that we're hoping to get passed that will provide legal um, vacature and um, expungement for survivors who've been convicted of crimes as a result of their trafficking. What we mean by that is maybe someone was forced to commit a crime, and that could be something like a prostitution charge, a drug sales charge, shoplifting, something around immigration status. Um, and they may, um, they may get charged with these crimes or even get convicted and incarcerated. Um, and so the TSRA or Trafficking Survivors Relief Act would allow a way for them to have their, um, their trafficking considered as either a reason to have the charges uh, taken away and expunged, which means it's no longer in the system, um, or to at least have their trafficking considered as what they call a mitigating factor. So maybe if you, um, if you did kill someone, you're not going to get off the hook entirely, um, but they would consider that when they are developing how long you would be incarcerated, right? So that's an example of what the Trafficking Survivors Relief Act would provide. A few different iterations of it as they were working on drafts of this bill included that it excluded people who were convicted of trafficking, that it, it, will, it will not apply for a trafficking charge. And we can see how for a lot of survivors, that would be something that was important to them. They might be like, I don't want someone to get their trafficking charges dropped. But the reality is a lot of trafficking survivors, especially in the sex trades, are later forced by their traffickers to do things like recruit other people or, um, you know, supervise them, punish them, um, manage what they're doing. And when that happens, those people often take the hit and end up getting criminalized because then the trafficker can say, I didn't do anything. This person did the recruiting. Why are you coming after me? Um, and so that's an example of a proposed policy that excludes some survivors. And that's where we can come back and say, hey, 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 wait, there's a lot of survivors who got convicted of trafficking charges while they were being trafficked. Do we really want to exclude them? from this relief. Another thing might be giving them insights about how an important historical or cultural influence is not being considered in the work they're doing. Um, so one of the things that um, comes up a lot when we're talking about child welfare um, is that there will be recommendations about um, child welfare reforms and ideas that are being developed by one specific group of um, of people, even survivors who maybe don't have some of the same experiences. Maybe they have found the child welfare system um, to need some, some reform, but to generally feel like it's, a, you know, a, a wonderful thing. Well, having a survivor, for example, whose grandparents were taken away from their indigenous communities and put into residential schools and being declared as unfit parents because they didn't fit into um, white cultural norms, Having that insight, someone can say, wait a minute, um, right here you say that people don't trust child welfare systems because they don't understand how child welfare works. But I think that if we say that, we're ignoring that some people don't trust child welfare systems because those systems have been used to disrupt their families and to take their kids away in the past. Um, we don't wanna pretend like that's them not understanding. That's us needing to figure out how to reform and rebuild trust. Another example is sharing how proposed language or protocols might impact survivors differently. What we mean by that is not every survivor needs the same thing, right? And so sometimes when we make a blanket protocol, we're gonna make a protocol that nobody 
um, you know, this is one that comes up a lot. Phones get taken away um, from survivors the moment they come into our shelter. They are not allowed to have survivors or have their phones at all. Um, and it might be that that survivor has been feeling really isolated for a while and that um, because the only because their trafficker isolated them and the only ways they can really keep community and support is by being able to text with some of their family who live far away. Right. And so that survivor may be more likely to leave your program, which puts them at higher risk for being re-exploited if they aren't able to maintain those really essential relationships. So that's something we can do is point out ways that their language or protocols might have different effects on different survivors based on their unique experiences. We can also provide ideas for how to blend research and evidence-based practices with real life solutions. So what I mean by that is the research and the evidence is really, really important. And also, someone who does not have lived experience may have a hard time envisioning how to turn the, the theoretical research into actual practices that prevent trafficking and help survivors. And so that's where if you have someone who's got that research background really getting feedback and collaborating with someone who has, and ideally multiple someones, who have lived experience, then they can collaboratively be like, so here's what the research shows. How do we put this into practice? And the ideas are gonna be so much more effective in the end. Just a, a reminder, and I, I know I beat this drum a lot, but I'm gonna beat it again today. Stories are not always necessary to share your insights. You can share your insights without sharing anything about your personal lived experience. And there's a variety of reasons um, why you might not want to do um, a whole lot of storytelling. We've talked about those in some of our other trainings, especially the one around trauma-informed storytelling. We have a, a training for that available at our YouTube channel. But you can always say things like, um, some survivors may find that such and such. You also want to respect confidentiality. If it's not your story, you don't want to share someone else's whole business in your feedback. So maybe in that feedback, you come up with a composite story where you're like, you know, I've spoken with survivors who experienced blah, 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 and then kind of mix together different pieces of different folk stories so that it's, it's really capturing real life um, examples, but without telling anyone's real life story. And then always, 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 always be conscious of your, whether or not you're wanting to share your story because you have your own need to be heard, which is very important. And also there are outlets for that. Um, you know, obviously therapy, support groups, if you get to where you want doing public storytelling events, writing a book, collaborating with someone on an article about your life. Those are really wonderful ways to address your need to be heard. But the group needs to work collaboratively. If you're working collaboratively and giving feedback, you want to be thoughtful to how the, work, the collaboration is shared. How is the space being shared in this collaboration? And also be conscious of other people's time, but also other people's trauma. Um, I work full time in this field, sometimes more than 40 hours a week. And um, if I had to hear people's trauma stories at every meeting I went to, I would have quit a really long time ago. It is really, really contributes to high levels of burnout and also to high levels of conflict between survivors and between collaborators. <clears throat> so there's a few different ways you need to provide document review. Um, you may be asked to provide review by reading a document that they send you and then emailing your feedback to a team leader Sometimes they'll send you a survey with some questions and ask you after reading the document or viewing the video, submit your feedback through a form to give them that feedback. You may be asked to attend a meeting or an interview to share your feedback. And what I would say in those spaces is take notes while you're reading the document or watching the video, because without fail, you will get into that meeting and forget what you wanted to say. So bring your notes with you. Um, you may be asked to participate in a focus group, and again, be conscious of how you share space because everybody in that focus group is exactly as awesome as you are and deserves the right to be heard and to share that space. 
Um, and they may ask you to add comments and suggestions to a Google Drive document. And I'm going to share just super quickly what that might look like. So give me just a moment. So here's an example of um, how you would edit directly into Google Docs, right? So someone might send you a document here and, and there's a lot of different things you can do up there, but we're not gonna focus on those right now. I'm gonna show you two things that are useful in Google Docs. One of them is adding a comment. So if you wanna add a comment, say you read this sentence and you want to say something like, slow the roll, people may not know what that means, especially if English isn't their first language. So you can add comments by highlighting the words here and then click plus to add comment. And then type in your comment. Um, and that's where you can go in and add people who, uh, who have English as a second language may not understand this phrase. <clears throat> and then when you're done, click comment. So what will happen is now when other collaborators look at this document, um, they will see your comment there. They can even reply to your comment. When they click on it, they may come in and say something like, I agree, excellent point. Maybe instead we should say, and then put whatever they would recommend. Right, so you see how you can collaborate through these comments um, without having to all be in the same room at the same time. The other thing I will add is right now I have editing mode and that means I can go in and just change the words. I can change day to say week, right? But let's say I want to, um, I want to edit, I want to suggest an edit to this, but I don't want the other person to not know that I made a change. So sometimes what you can do is if you're not already in suggesting mode, look up here. If it's a pencil, that's editing mode. You can click this little arrow and change it to suggesting. Now you can tell it's suggesting mode because it's in that little green, I don't know, the icon looks a little different, right? So watch this. If I come back to change day to week, what's gonna happen is that now we're changing some of the words. And that way, when the person comes back to look at your document, they can see the changes you're suggesting and choose to take them or not, right? And it may be that they're like, no, we don't want to wait a whole, um, or, or maybe they say, actually, a week sounds good. Yeah, wait a week before responding. So they would click check to accept that suggestion, and it automatically makes your change. They may be like, responding makes sense. Why did you want to change that to replying? I don't know why we would do that. And click X, which rejects your suggestion. Knowing how to work in suggesting mode makes it very easy for us to do like really detailed editing without having to add as many comments and gives them a chance to go back in and, and accept or reject your feedback. So those are two things you'll want to know how to do is add a comment and work in editing mode to um, make suggestions that aren't automatically, um, automatically accepted. So um, coming back to our um, screen share here. The last thing that I would love to remind everybody as you're considering giving feedback, and this is something that can be hard for some of us, they're probably not going to take all your feedback. And it's not because they don't like you. It's not because it's not good feedback. It's not because they hate survivors or they're not survivor informed. A lot of times it's because they need to make the best decisions they can based on their audience, their goals, their organization and its values and processes. Um, also, if you've ever been in a group with multiple survivors giving feedback, sometimes we don't agree with each other. We're giving different feedback and disagreeing with each other. And they, that person who creates the document is going to have to take the opportunity to consider all of your ideas and then try to come up with the best thing they can that, that addresses um, all the feedback they got in a respectful way. 
So if you go back and you look at the document and they, there's feedback they didn't take, try not to take it personally or get your feelings hurt. That's just part of doing this work. We always say the thing that is truthful. We always advocate for survivors. We always say the thing that is courageous and brave, but we don't always get the end results we were hoping for. Um, so that is super important to remember. And for me, honestly, I've been doing this a while and still when I give feedback, if I look at the final document and it has one of my changes that I suggested made in it, I get excited because I know not to expect that all the time. So remember, that's not about you. That's not personal. Um, they, they're just not always going to take every single thing you say. They're not going to be able to. And so I think I'm going to stop my recording now so that I can work with the folks who are here. And thank you so much for joining us.